I have a video that's expected out around about Tuesday that's going to be going after spirit science on the whole chakra thing. And in general, I'm going after the New Age movement. I'm just using him as, I guess you could say, my poster boy for the New Age stuff. But this particular segment is going to be a part of it. But I've decided that I should also release it separately as well after further consideration. In part because I promised some people that I would tell them that there is some science behind the chakras and what it is. One thing to keep in mind when dealing with such th things is that a lot of these ancient traditions came from primitive understandings of biology. Now in the case of the vagus nerve, when you're talking about the nadis, these breath channels, the word nadi actually translates to nerve, and I believe that's where the hint lies. Now finding hard evidence that this is where these thoughts come from is, well, a little sketchy at best, and I will admit that. But in the early days, when people started getting injured and what have you, they did try to figure out what was going on to some degree. Now, of course, there's also the tantric beliefs and what have you. But putting all of those aside, there is something interesting about the little chakra positions. And that's interesting thing is what we refer to as the vagus nerve. Now, if you look over the diagram that we have here, over... I can't actually point to that part of the screen with the way my camera's lined up. Fuck it. You'll notice that we have a whole bunch of little nerves going around here, and it has them all listed. What we're worried about is nerve X, which is down that away. And you'll see it, look, it's the one that has the most things connected to it. One, you'll have like the eyes, or the face, or what have you. But no, 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 the vagus nerve, nerve X, is massive. It's the holy grail of the nervous system, in a manner of speaking. It starts up here, well, technically up here, snakes its way down, and then connects to pretty much all of your different organs. So the question is, of course, how does this, why, how can this be iterated or makes be made sense of in terms of this notion of the chakras? Well, keep in mind, ancient traditions, cutting people open, you find this strange thing snaking through the body, connecting to all the different vital organs, not necessarily knowing what all those organs are for, what they do. Then you start attributing strange things to it, not really fully understanding what you're looking at. Now, the interesting thing, or perhaps the most interesting thing, is that if you take a look at things at where the major connections are, you'll note that a lot of them line up with these supposed chakra positions. It connects in by the throat, and then it moves down and has connections that could go in by the heart and lungs, and then you have your areas like liver, stomach, etc., and then we move down to pancreas and so on. Get this out of the way. Um, actually, there's one other I was going to show before this, but uh, I think this one will do well enough. I do have one that's in isolation of the vagus nerve. Let me see if I can bring that one up. Um, give me one moment, please. And I don't have that one right now. Oh, well, we'll have to go with this one for now. Now, if you'll notice he here, we have this um, sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic ner <coughs> nervous, symp nervous system displayed here. And you'll notice the green is parasympathetic, and that is right here. We have this green one going down there. These ones up here, these are the first several. But right here we have the tenth, the vagus nerve going down. Connects in, connects up at the brain, comes down here, connects to the throat. Then we have this branch off here that goes to heart and lungs. Go down a little further, and then we have a, your esophagus, stomach, a abdomen, liver, and then it goes down further, and you have your intestines down here. Interestingly enough, um, one thing that is of note is the connection from the sexual organs and whatnot leading back here to the spine, and where that actually works back in. Then on the back side, where you have the sympathetic, you have the nerves that come up to where they come up to meet the actual vagus nerve. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the vagus nerve communicates two ways. The brain sends a signal down, and then the signal comes back up. There are quite a number of things that are modulated by this. Um, for example, acetylcholine production is dealt with, which helps the immune system and attenuates inflammatory damage. Um, aldosterone secretion and the adrenals and kidneys, which is connected to blood flow as well. Um, 
and the vagus works with all of these things. Now this is a two-way channel. It's not just the brain sending out signals. It's the brain sends out the signal, gets a response, that response goes back up, and based upon this negotiation, this handshake, so to speak, back and forth, is how things are figured out. Um, it takes care of the cortisol production of the pituitary, it um, regulates glutamate production, and a number of other things. I do have a couple of studies pertaining to this. Incidentally, if you actually look up the vagus nerve and see what if different systems it affects and all the studies pertaining to the vagus nerve, you'll actually find over 13,000 studies. This is something we've known uh, for quite a bit of a while. Now, it's highly likely, um, possible, and I think likely, frankly, although it's somewhat hypothetical, that the ancients, um, thousands of years ago, the ancient Hin Hindus, were sitting there and dissecting people and trying to figure out how some of this stuff worked. Now, granted, they got some of it right, but a lot of it wrong. Um, one thing that's very much worth note, though, in terms of vagus nerve stimulation, there are a few ways to do it, and some of these ways do involve exercise, meditation, and deep controlled breathing. Well, lo and behold, you take those, put them together, and you have varied practices of both meditation, yoga, some of the Buddhist practices, etc. So they might have been onto something. Of course, not having the real science, they didn't know what they were on to. Um, I'm going to actually jump back to the chart here for a moment. Now, if you'll notice that there's a couple major nerve plexuses here. And relatively speaking, these do correspond to some of the positions that are noted in the chakras. You have your red, you have your, your orange, your yellow, and up by where we have the heart and lungs here, we have the green, and technically pink as well. And then you go up to your throat, where you have that lovely little blue. So there is technically something to it. Now, as for the third eye and all this other stuff, there is a part of the that nerve up in the skull that if it's damaged or muck with, you can start having very delusions. There's also been some stipulation that it might be involved in the production of varied brain chemicals, including things like oxytocin. However, I've not gotten comprehensive studies on that. What I do have, on the other hand, if I can switch to the next image here, and let's resize that a touch. There we go. Now, one thing I'm going to note, though, is, as I said, it's a little bit like a handshake. It's a little bit of a back and forth between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic divisions here. So, for example, the vagus side can, st simulates the tear glands, sympathetic side, the spinal side, that is, um, has no effect on the tear. Oh, wait, I'm on the wrong nerve. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Inhibits heart and dilates the um, arterioles and on the spinal side accelerates and constricts and going back and forth you can see constricts and versus dilates bronchi stimulates stomach versus inhibits stomach motility um, sec secretion and um, stimulates pancreas inhibits pancreas secretion so it's this uh, constant back and forth between the two and just for the sake of fun in terms of this whole kundalini th stuff, the supposed serpent that coils three times. Now, mind you, the vagus snakes all throughout the body. This diagram, of course, has a parse out, but it snakes out all through the different organs, and then it connects into the spine three times. Well, could this be where this, these beliefs pertaining to the kundalini came from? I think it's possible. I think it's actually quite possible. But what varied things? Um, I, I did a bit of research. Um, I put up the first part of the research as a raw file. Um, in addition to that, I did some additional research. And in terms of the more psychiatric side of things, I do have some notes on that, which I'm going to be uh, putting in the links. I actually have several papers that people sent me, and this has actually been really great. But varied things that are, are <clears throat> deal with the vagus nerve. Um, memory retention, heart rate memory, calmness, blood pressure, respiration, neuroplasticity, immune system response, reduces neural inflammation damage, which can um, leave the body prone to infection, unfortunately, um, reducing stress levels and anxiety. Dep um, it can actually help with alleviating depression. Um, and we're talking in the case of non-drug response of chronic depression in this case, help with 
epilepsy. Um, brain area, it influences brain areas that enhance the neurotransmission of serotonin and norepinephrine. I can't never fucking say that. And modulates the balance between the two. Um, studies have also noted cognitive and behavioral improvements based upon vagal stimulation as well. The vagus nerve is like the holy grail of the human body. Now for the problem. Now, yes, through varied breathing exercise and this kind of stuff, you can stimulate the nerve. And it can also overstimulate it and you can also screw it up. Um, this whole Kundalini release that most people are talking about, this supposed spiritual awakening. Yeah. When you feel that warm feeling, that's you putting extra strain on that nerve and you're risking damaging it. Now, since that nerve is influenced or involved, I should say, in so many of these different interactions, damaging, damaging the, the vagus nerve will really fuck you up. This whole Kundalini syndrome thing, that's damaging the vagus nerve. It's not some spiritual thing. It's not because of these strange mystical centers in you. It's because there are nerves there. And if you damage them, you fuck them up. And that's part of why I'm concerned about these kind of things. Because let's not break ourselves, you know? All in the name of supposedly trying to reach spiritual enlightenment. But that's it on the vagus nerve for now. Now the chakras themselves, the weird spinning vortex things, and the weird funky colors, and all this other stuff that they talk about. Throw it out, that out the window. Just ignore all that. The thing is, through some of these practices, you can activate this nerve. Now, can you get all these kind of results we can get with science? Not so much. Um, there are actual devices that are implanted sometimes, as well as varied other ways to actually activate it otherwise, and more targeted ways. Uh, there are currently several different treatments pertaining to this, involving things like chronic depression and epilepsy and um, Let's see, what was the other one? Um, heart arrhythmia and things along these lines. So, yeah, there's something to it. But as always, it's not what people think. Norm the thing is, the theory should be that, yes, maybe the ancients had some wisdom. Maybe they figured something out. But if so, what? And once you figure out what it is that they actually figured out, and once you're able to figure out what the science is behind it, throw away the bullshit. Because... Science is much cooler than this whole fake spiritual shit, man. Well, shadow out. I don't need to close like that. Oh, and I almost forgot. The seventh chakra doesn't exist. On the vagus nerve, or in any other manner. Sorry about that.